afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for joining us today at our webinar on NCOTAN 2020 and Force Major. The webinar is organized by Azerbaijan Bank Association and ICC UAE, which is also supported by Dubai Chamber of Commerce and Industry. The webinar is for one hour, which will be by, moderated by Mr. Yasin Jalilov. And uh, I will now hand over to Mr. Yasin. So over to you, Mr. Yasin. I mean, thanks a lot. Uh, dear colleagues, first of all, I would like to, to, thank, uh, to thank the Association, Azerbaijan Banking Association, uh, ICC, United Arab Emirates, and supported by Dubai Chamber of Commerce and Industry for organizing of, of this event. Uh, also, let me welcome all of you and that you find a time, uh, even for your lunch, right? for now uh, to spend it with us. Uh, it is an important set of uh, ICC rules that were using the several, that are used for several decades and in every country in the world to facilitate the secure international trade. Uh, most of you are, are aware that this, uh, the ninth version of Inca Terms 2020 is now in operation and uh, started from uh, 1st of January 2020. So today we are looking forward to learn details of the rules, some key changes and perhaps some experiences with the rules in the past uh, year and a half. Uh, these rules form an essential part of the day-to-day -day international trade as well as domestic trades and they form an integral part of many sales contracts worldwide. Uh, Issues such as uh, force majeure are also very important and something uh, we heard a lot about during the pandemic. It was a uh, uh, stock in Suez Canal of uh, evergreen container ship, that very, very famous container, container ship that created a huge logistic problem for many countries and uh, generated uh, several billion losses, US dollars, seven billion US dollar losses for uh, many companies. Uh, I'm very glad to say that today our facilitator in this webinar is uh, well known to most of you, Mr. Vincent O'Brien, and uh, he has been visiting Baku for a long time and uh, we look forward to welcoming him again in Baku in the near future. Uh, Winston uh, has been a member in ICC of ICC Banking Commission and associate direct director of the Institute of International Banking Law and Practice. Um, actually, for a time as long as I know myself in the trade finance, he's, <laughs> he's there. And uh, he's now the director of uh, ICC United Arab Emirates. Uh, we are also very pleased to be working uh, with the Dubai Chamber of Commerce, which has an international office in Baku. And uh, I'm very glad to uh, give a short welcome from Dubai Chamber and to learn about the uh, Dubai Chamber activities in Azerbaijan. I will turn over to Mr. Uh, Sanan Nasibli, uh, the Chief Representative, Dubai Chamber International Office in Azerbaijan. Uh, Sanan. Uh, your, the floor is yours. Uh, yes, Andre, thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we um, are very delighted to be part of this event, to be supporting it, um, even though virtually, and we look forward to being uh, part of the future events, both physical and virtual. Once, um, we are the Dubai Chamber International Office in Azerbaijan, established in October of 2012 to support Dubai Chamber's members' business in Eurasia, which is a market of 11 countries. And to be precise, it is uh, Azerbaijan and Georgia in the Caucasus, entire Central Asia, Russia, Ukraine, Belarus, and Moldova. And we've been operating since, uh, like I said, October 2012 in Baku, Azerbaijan, covering the entire region. We are part of the international network of offices of the Dubai Chamber, of which there are 10 other throughout the world. We have offices in Panama, Brazil, Argentina, four offices in Africa, that is in Ghana, Kenya, Mozambique, and Ethiopia. We have an office in India, Mumbai, and also two offices in China, in Shanghai and Shenzhen, and also an office in Nairobi. So we are part of the international uh, network of offices, and we are responsible for Eurasia, including, of course, our uh, Baku, Azerbaijan 
uh, being located in Morocco. So we are very happy to support this event. We are here to facilitate trade between uh, Dubai and the rest of the region. And if you have clients who are looking for um, both export and import or trade and investment relations with Dubai or Dubai companies, our office will be happy to support those inquiries as well. We are available on Facebook and LinkedIn, so feel, please feel free to engage with us at your convenience. And again, it's a pleasure to be uh, supporting this event. Thank you very much. Now over um, to uh, Mr. Vincent, and I wish you everyone a great uh, training experience with a great trainer. So over to you, Vincent. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Sam, and uh, that, that's really wonderful. And uh, Yasin, uh, thank you again for the great introduction. And uh, you're making me sound very old that I'm in the Banking Commission as long as you can remember. So thank you. I owe you for this compliment, which I will uh, repay in person when I see you. <laughs> In Baku. No, 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 isn't. I'm not a, a, as as old as you think. So I'm I'm young also. So it's okay. <laughs> so wonderful. So um, everyone, I'm I, I, I'm delighted to be here virtually, and uh, I, I'm looking forward to being in Baku uh, physically. But our event today is actually, as Yasin said, very important. It's about this book of rules, the Incoterms 2020 rules. And as he indicated, they are used in every single country in the world. So my objective today is in our short period of time, take you through all the key elements of the rules, the obligations of the parties, how they are applied in practice. And as was requested by a number of people, talk a little bit about force majeure and maybe give one or two cases that happened as a result of the pandemic, but also as a result of the issues regarding the evergreen container ship that got stuck in the Suez Canal and actually is still stuck in the area in the Great Bitter Lake. Uh, so uh, as Jason said, uh, really, really serious issues, but we'll try and also make it somewhat entertaining. So with this, I'm going to uh, share my screen with you and get underway with my presentation. Okay, so basically, when we're looking at Incoterms, it's a book of rules. And as we see on the screen, the rules are used in every country. They're a book of rules that are applied to the contract of sale between the seller and the buyer, used mostly in international trade. But as Yazan already said, they can also be used domestically and the use domestically is growing. But sometimes with a contract, something goes wrong. Okay, the contract may be frustrated or stopped due to what we call force majeure. And of course, a force majeure means a big force, okay? So uh, maybe I'm a force majeure, I'm not quite, or maybe I'm a little force, okay? So when we move on, I just want to give you an ICC definition of uh, force majeure that will set the scene for when I later on talk about particular cases regarding force majeure. So what is a force majeure in terms of contracts? Well, a force majeure means an occurrence. So an event, something happens, okay? Something happens that impedes or prevents the performance of the contract by one or more of the contracting parties. So I plan to deliver the goods, I plan to perform the contract, but something happened that stopped me performance. So sometimes force majeure will enable me to escape my obligations. But for the force majeure to apply with the ICC definition, such impediment or event or blockage, blockage, okay, must be beyond the control and it's defined as reasonable control of the parties. And the second point, point B, is that this event or impediment could not reasonably have been foreseen at the time of the conclusion of the contract or agreeing the contract. And C, the force majeure event must be one that affects the impediment and one that could not reasonably have been avoided or overcome by the affected party. So this definition is pretty good, but we've seen in the last year there have been challenges or problems, or I wasn't problems, but issues with this definition. And they stem from the word reasonable, because what I think is reasonable, maybe you think is unreasonable, okay? So we know it's an event uh, 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 preventing performance of the contract. Now, when we come to ICC rules of practice, 
particularly the ones you deal with, trade finance rules, we have what's actually called the force majeure rule within UCP, URDG, URC, etc. But the, what I want to highlight with you is, in terms of ICC rules and trade finance, UCP, URDG, etc., then the focus is very narrow in that in these rules, it only focuses on one thing. And that one thing is the interruption of the bank's business. But the consequences can be very serious. So for example, if I am an exporter with an export letter of credit in my favor, and if there is a force majeure such as a lockdown in Ireland, in my country, and as a result, I could not deliver the documents uh, to the bank because the bank was closed due to the interruption of the bank's business. And then the letter of credit expired. At that time, tough luck for the exporter, the letter of credit has expired. Similarly with URDG, it deals with interruption of the bank's business, but at least with URDG, and also with, with the URDG, there is an extinction of 30 calendar days, which gives some protection to the beneficiary because most force majeures are short. But as we saw with the pandemic, in some countries, the force majeure was short and others it was long. But I will come back to this a little bit later in terms of the contracting, shipping and delivery of goods. Now, back on track with our Inco terms. Um, as Yasin said, there's been many versions of the rules. Uh, the last version is on the right-hand side of your screen, but now we're looking at the rule book, Inco terms 2020. And I would recommend that you get a copy of the rule book while my seminar will highlight the key issues in the rules. There's nothing better than reading the rules. So please obtain the rules. <laughs> We see on the rule book, it says ICC rules for the use of domestic and international trade terms. And in my presentation today, it will deal mostly with international, international contract of sale. Why so important? Because it means the seller and the buyer in two different jurisdictions. Two different jurisdictions with different local law, different local regulation, different customs and practice. So this is where the rules are really, really important. As we heard, the rules are around for many decades, but they were first published in 1936, revised many times, and the latest version is the one on the right-hand side, Incoterms uh, 2020. Now, why I highlight the history is that over the years, there have been so many disputes between sellers and buyers, which means that they go to court regarding the contract. And over all the years, the ICC rules, uh, including and especially Incoterms, have been totally tested and proven to be very reliable, totally reliable in setting out the obligations of the seller and the buyer. A little bit of background on the rules, but you know, it's history. So, well, it's not that important. What you need to know is the current rules, but just for three minutes. If we go back to Incoterms 2020, there used to be 13 rules, 13 rules. But then it was decided that it's good to make the rules shorter and clearer. You know, short and clear, I hope, like me, short and clear, because short is good. So in the revision for 2010, the number of rules was reduced from 13 to 11. So D-A-F-D-E-S-D-E-Q-D-D-U, were removed, and these were replaced with two very practical Inca terms in 2010. And actually, I delivered a physical workshop in Baku way, way back then in 2010. In 2010, two new Inca terms, DAT and DAP. DAP and DAT. DAP delivered at place, DAT delivered at terminal. Now, in 2010, this Incoterm delivered at terminal was seen to be a very important innovation. In terms of transport development, the development in the 50s of the container, the metal container, like a box, was a huge development in shipping, facilitating trade. 
but in the in 2010 and just before the establishment of terminals whether that's a marine port terminal an airport cargo terminal or an inland terminal secured area for delivery of cargo became very important and we had the new inco term dat delivered at terminal but that is history Moving on to the recent changes between 2010 and 2020, well, it's kind of interesting because DAT, which was a major innovation in 2010, seems to have disappeared. Or really, I should say that DAT has now evolved into the Inco term DPU. So key learning point, one brand new Inco terms, Inco term 2020, DPU delivered at place unloaded, replacing or evolving from DAT. Next significant overall change would be that under the INCO terms, the C terms, CIF and CIP. Now, CIF, cost, insurance, and freight, would be a marine INCO term, a marine shipment, port to port or inland waterway port to another port. Well, under CIF and CIP in Inco terms 2010, the insurance was only required on minimum terms, basically covering full loss of the goods. But in the revision of the Inco terms in 2020, there is a change. CIF, the marine Inco term, remains at insurance on minimum terms, but CIP, which is used for marine, multimodal, but also extensively for air shipments, has changed in terms of the insurance requirements. So now under CIP, and think about it, air shipments, the goods are usually smaller, but much more valuable. Under CIP in Inco Terms 2020, the insurance required now the default insurance under CIP, not CIF, CIP, is that it should be equivalent to all risk cover, which typically is referred to, and you usually refer to in your letters of credit as Institute Cargo Clause A, A standing for all risk. So these are significant changes. Uh, some were actually renamed. And there was bigger coverage in the insurance under CIP. Now, when we actually opened the rule book on the Inco terms 2020, on the right hand side of your screen, you will see that for each of the 11 Inco terms, following the brief explanation in the rule book, there is set out on one hand side, on one side, the obligations of the seller the exporter, and on the other side, the obligations of the buyer. So there are 10 obligations each, okay, under the eco term. 11 rules, 10 obligations. Obligations of the seller, A1 to A10. Obligations of the buyer, B1 to B10. So basically, under each of these little eco terms of three letters, they tell us, for example, under XWorks or FOB or CIF or even the new one, DT DPU, under A2, it will tell us exactly when the seller has delivered the goods contractually. And it will also tell us when the buyer, B2, has actually taken delivery of the goods. So maybe, well, I'm Irish, as you know, maybe if I was in Ireland and you're in Baku, well, I could be the Irish exporter, but I could actually contractually deliver the goods to you at my premises, which would be X Works in Dublin, Ireland. Or else I could contractually deliver them to you at the port of loading, port of transshipment, airport of departure, airport of destination, depending on the chosen Inco term. Also under the Inco terms, we will actually see under A6, for example, we see which is the document, the delivery document, for example. So as you know, if it's a marine shipment, it will be a bill of lading, most likely, air shipment, airway bill, truck, it's going to be a CMR or a road consignment note, an equivalent rail, rail consignment note. A1 to A10, B1 to B10, and 11 Inco terms. When I move forward a little bit and I look at our seller, 
I think some of you have seen this picture before. Okay, so here we have this Irish exporter trying to export all over the world. Different countries, different jurisdictions. Here he's talking to this buyer, this buyer, and I think you might have seen this picture before, this buyer in Abu Dhabi. So the buyer is Abu Dhabi in a different in, in UAE, different jurisdiction, different law, different regulations. How can these guys ever agree a contract? Okay. Well, for example, O'Brien gives him the Inco term $3,250,000 CIF Jebel Ali Port. Inco terms 2020. Inco terms, just three letters. ABC is three letters. If you don't know your ABC, you cannot communicate. Inco terms, three letters. If you don't know your three lettered Inco terms, you cannot communicate in international trade. So, for example, this buyer knows his Inco terms. O'Brien said the Inco term is CIF. Well, just by having three letters, we know under CIF, the seller is responsible for the carriage, transport of goods. From port of loading to port of destination. CIF, we know the seller is responsible for organizing insurance. What amount? Minimum amount, 110% of CIF value. What risk? Well, under the rules, it's minimum risk unless otherwise agreed in the contract. CIF, who is responsible for paying the import duty? If we read the rule book, we see under CIF, all duties, taxes, import clearance, etc., for account of the buyer. So the Inca terms do not cover everything, but they cover the foundations of the obligations of the seller, of the buyer, under the contract of sale. Great, that was easy and clear. And that is the purpose of Inca terms, to make everything easy and clear. But of course, we know in reality, sometimes it's not so easy and not so clear. So here we have a map of the world and we have a buyer in Baku and Azerbaijan, we have the exporter in Ireland, different countries, different regulations. You don't know too much about our export clearance in Ireland. I don't know much about import clearance, our import duties, our customs in Azerbaijan. And I don't even know about your, well, you know, I know a little bit, I've been there, but generally speaking. So when we look at the Inco terms, we see that they're a book of international rules. Now, this is really important. They're not just a guideline, they're a rule. So if there's a dispute in a case and it goes to court or arbitration, the judge or the arbitrators will be saying, let's check out what the rule book actually says regarding delivery, etc." So day to day, incoderms are a really boring subject, really just so boring. But when there is a loss or non-delivery or a claim on the contract, they become really, really important. So when we look at the rules, we see that we have 11 rules. They're on your screen, starting EXW, FCA, FAS, FOB, CFR, CIS, CPT, DAP, DPU, the new one, and DDP, no change. So getting into a little bit more detail on the rules. But first, a little case study. Okay, this is a real story. Okay, and the Inco term in question in this dispute was FOB. But honestly, the goods were shipped in containers. So really the correct Inco term should have been FCA. But let's forget about that. But here's the story. A seller was exporting from Germany under the Inco term FOB, free on board. The seller got his goods to the port of loading Hamburg. The goods were loaded on board the vessel in a container, as we can see. But then there was a, maybe a, a, an accident. Kashmar, okay? So disaster. And when the container fell over, the exporter's goods were in this container here. The high value equipment fell out of the container into the water and were destroyed. The Inco term was FOB. So the buyer doesn't want to pay. I wouldn't want to pay. Really, I wouldn't want to pay. The guy didn't even ship the goods. Well, he put them on the ship, but the ship didn't even sail. So there was a big dispute between seller and buyer, but it was settled in one day, one day in arbitration, because they had the rule book. 
And when they opened the rule book, they saw under FOB, the risk transfers, the goods are delivered when the goods are placed on board the vessel at the port of shipment and the seller can provide the customary transport document, the bill of lading. So in this case, the seller had the bill of lading in his hand. The goods were placed on board the vessel. And even though the ship has not sailed, the buyer was contractually obliged to pay for the goods. Now, there was another issue regarding a letter of credit in this case, but I'm not going there right now, but just it was clarified that contractually the buyer had an obligation to pay. Very interesting. So then we move on to our Inco terms, and we see that when we look at the actual rules, we see that there are kind of two groupings. And uh, regarding the groupings, on the bottom of your screen, you can see the ones for inland waterway and transport, inland waterway and marine shipment, sea and inland waterway, FAS, FOB, CIF, CFR. And then on the top of your screen, screen, you see the ones that are used for any mode of transport or multimodal transport. And I'm not wanting to uh, go too much off the point right now, but we all think about shipping, we think about ships and the sea. But in terms of the logistics supply chain, interesting things are happening. In terms of goods being shipped, air shipments are increasing dramatically at the moment and have been in recent times. And right now it's estimated that in terms of value, not quantity, because the quantity is much smaller, but in terms of value of goods shipped, nearly 30% of goods shipped in value terms is shipped now by air. And this trend is going to continue as a consequence of the pandemic, as a consequence of the pandemic, you know? So for example, even here in the UAE, we have the largest now airline in the world. UAE is becoming, or Dubai, the fastest transshipment hub. It's the fastest growing trade corridor in the world between Asia, Southeast Asia, Central Asia, and the African continent. And again, of course, uh, you can build an airport, well, the Chinese can build an airport in a matter of months, where a port takes an awful lot longer, but that's another story for another day. Now, my dear friends, I'm watching the clock and I'm going to go very quickly through the Inco terms, but I will stop and go a little bit slower for the case studies and for the new Inco term, but otherwise I go really quick. Fast, you're already familiar. We start with EXW. I'm the Irish exporter. And on our screen, we see an ICC, a diagram that's around for a long time. On the left, we have the seller with the goods. At the top, on the right, we have the buyer with the money. And we are hoping to exchange the goods for the money. Okay, the goods for the, the money. Dingy. So, and then of course, and we have the seller with the goods inland transport, export clearance, the house with the blue flag. Then we have loading, international transport, unloading, the house with the red flag, import duty, local transport, and the buyer. In our diagram, then we have three elements here to explain. Who is responsible, seller or buyer, for the carriage of goods, which is the transport of goods between the seller and the buyer? When exactly are the goods delivered by the seller to the buyer, between the seller and the buyer, and who pays the costs up to certain points, seller or buyer. And then of course we have export, export clearance and import clearance. So EXW, well, minimum obligation of the seller. I just provide my goods available at my premises. Well, usually at my premises. Delivery of the goods, I deliver them at my premises, there is no carriage. The cost, it's just the cost of the goods because I don't even have to load them. I don't even have to load them under the buyer's means of conveyance. So if I want a quiet life, a very relaxed life, and I'm an exporter, EXW is a good eco term. But if I want to do business and make some money, it's not really a good eco term. Of course, it is used, it is used to a limited degree, but it's giving all the obligations and risk to the buyer. And actually it won't work 
Because if you want to buy from me in Ireland, okay, right, you need to ship the goods, you need to get export clearance. And in Ireland, you will only get, or in the EU, you may only get the export clearance if you're resident in the EU. So I wouldn't really recommend it. But then we move from the E terms, X works onto the F terms. And when we move on to F terms, we use FCA, free carrier. So for example, if you're buying equipment from me again, and I say, I will give you an X works price, you probably would say, sorry, Ben, no, uh, it's not suitable because uh, we would have to do the export clearance under X works. But what's your price FCA? And then I would say, okay, FCA, my price will go up a little bit because under FCA, I have a carriage obligation to bring the goods from my premises and deliver them into the custody of the carrier nominated by the buyer. It's not a big obligation, but it's a little obligation. So my price probably goes up a little bit. Delivery and risk. The goods are delivered and the risk transfers when the seller delivers the goods to the carrier or the carrier's agent nominated by the buyer. So once I get the goods, for example, to the airport and I get that transport document, the goods are going by air. So perhaps an airway bill, the goods have been delivered at that point in time. Under all F terms, if an incoterm begins with the letter F, the seller has an obligation in all F terms for export clearance of the goods, okay? So the seller must pay any and are responsible for these costs until the goods are delivered to the carrier or the carrier's agent. Then of course, the buyer is responsible for the carriage obligation. The freight under FCA on an airway bill would most likely be marked freight collect, freight collect as you would expect. Importer pays the import duty, et cetera. Free alongside ship is one we use in my country, Ireland, a lot. So where the seller delivers the goods on the quay at the port of shipment, but not on board. So typically in Ireland, we do this exporting beef. When the buyer will charter a vessel, will hire a full vessel for a time or a voyage, and they will bring their ship to the port of shipment, and the Irish exporter will have the goods on the quay but not shipped on board. So the bill of lading is usually, not always, but usually a charter party bill of lading. And it's usually a receipt for shipment, charter party bill of lading. And then when the goods are ultimately shipped on board, the master or captain will sign the bill of lading and stamp it. On board notation, shipped on board, the name of the vessel and a particular date. So FAS, and of course, you're all familiar with them, um, FOB. Everyone is familiar with FOB. No change, really. The only change with FOB is that the language in the book describing it is a little bit shorter and a little bit clearer. The language is just a little bit more precise, which is good. Under FOB, I, as a seller, it's a marine term, marine or inland waterway. I must deliver the goods on board the vessel at the port of shipment. I must provide the document, which will be the bill of lading. The goods are delivered and the risk transfers when they are placed on board. The extra cost involved is the cost of loading the goods on board the vessel. But now under an FOB bill of lading, again, I would expect it to be marked freight collect because it's the buyer that is actually paying the freight for the goods. The buyer pays any import duty, uh, et cetera. Moving on, and uh, we have a great number of people here. Wow, it's great. We're nearly about, we're just over 60. It's amazing. So under CFR, cost and freight, now we're moving the obligation of the seller a little bit further on, increasing. Under CFR, marine term, the seller is responsible to organize the carriage, the transport, the marine shipment to the name port of destination. However, under the rule book for delivery and transfer of risk, risk transfers when the goods are placed on board the vessel at the port of shipment. Now that sounds strange because the input term is CFR, named port of destination, but the delivery and the risk transfers at the port of shipment. Sounds strange, 
but that's the rule, okay? And the seller pays the costs of until the goods are delivered to the port of destination. So if you were looking at this bill of lading and it's CFR, I think we would expect it to be marked a uh, freight paid, freight paid, all clear, all clear. And I'm just checking, have I any questions here? And not yet, okay, so we're all okay. And yeah, as I said, we are over 50. So from CFR, it's very easy to move forward to the next Inca term. And we move to CIF. So basically, CIF is CFR with an I, cost, insurance, and freight. Carriage, transport obligation, marine to the name port of destination. Delivery, transfer of risk, CIF name port of destination. But the risk transfers when the goods are, again, shipped or placed, placed on board the vessel at the port of shipment. That sounds even more strange because the seller must organize the insurance to the name port of destination. But don't forget it. The risk transfers, the goods are delivered when the goods are placed on board the vessel at the name port of shipment. The seller must pay the costs which are going up because now it includes the insurance premium for the insurance certificate, minimum of 110% as we have actually explained. Okay. So moving on from uh, CIF, and then after CIF, well, we move into a case study. So here I'm going to slow down. I was sitting at my computer in Dubai, okay? And the next thing I got an email. So I got an email from a lady called Ashi, okay? And I happened to meet her at one of my seminars uh, in the past. So she sent me a query regarding CIF, name port of destination, force majeure. But let's zoom in so we can all read it, okay? It's a bit small on my computer. So here is the query. Dear Vincent, I guess, okay? We shipped on the basis of CIF. We just talked about it. CIF and port B. I guess port B is name port of destination. Inco terms 2020. The goods were loaded on board the vessel and she called the vessel Vin. Wow, that's a nice name. It's a good name for a ship. Shipped on board the vessel Vin at port A, which is port of shipment, I guess, for destination port, port B. Sounds good to me. Sounds perfect. There's no problem here. Oh, the problem. The problem is that you two lockout, or should that be lockdown? or lockout, I don't know. The problem is that you to lockout at the port of destination. Ah, so the goods are shipped, but I guess this is pandemic, force majeure, COVID-19, okay. The pro now, now I understand. The problem is that you to lockout at the port of destination, which means all the employees are locked out, so they can't come to work. The goods could not be unloaded. Wow, and the buyer is suffering acute delay we all did in this pandemic, in delivery of goods plus the marriage, the charge for non-removal of the goods from the port. Wow, wow. The buyer is holding back payment due to force majeure at the port of discharge, which he, the buyer, says is unexpected and beyond his control. It is, it is. And is as it is driven by a state, a straight, it, 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 under his control as it is a state driven lockdown for health purposes. Wow. So the buyer is not paying because he can't get the goods. Now, don't quote me on it, but if I couldn't get the goods, um, I wouldn't feel like paying, to be honest. I don't think you would either. But uh, as she has a problem. So her problem is, what can I do? As if the goods not delivered, we will lose our payment rights. That would be the payment rights under the contract. Wow. You know, Ashi is really lucky that we have the Incoterms, okay? Because under the Incoterm rule book and the rule that applied, as she said in her email, is CIF Incoterms 2020. That's agreed between seller and buyer. But the good news for Ashi is that under CIF, she has already delivered the goods. They're stuck at the port of destination but the delivery actually occurred contractually when they were placed on board the vessel at the port of shipment. 
So I replied with this answer to um, Ashi and, uh, uh, and she was delighted. Uh, she got her, it took a little while, but she got her money under the contract. And following this, she bought 10 books of incoterms, okay? One for each finger on each of her hands. Very amazing. So I was very happy. And Habib was really excited about this. He sold 10 books of incoterms in one go. Okay. So moving forward, if the goods, for example, were going by air, we wouldn't use CFR, we would use CPT. Carriage obligation to the named airport of destination, but the risk would transfer again, as we explained, when the goods are transferred, handed, sorry, not transferred, handed into the custody of the carrier or the carrier's agent at the airport of departure. All costs in terms of carriage Air freight will be for the account of the CPT, the CPT, the seller. The seller will be paying the freight charges to the named airport of destination. But of course, the buyer will be paying the import duty in the country of import. So CPT Baku. Oh, and I have a question here. Uh, under oh, good question from uh, anonymous attendee. Okay, so under CIF, who makes a claim under the insurance? That's a good question. Under CIF, the seller must organize the insurance. The seller must pay the insurance premium. The goods are delivered when they're placed on board the vessel under CIF. But if something happens to goods while they're in transit and they get stuck or they get lost or stolen. Oh, ever given, mentioned by Yasin. I'll come to it in a minute. Any risk, any claim must be initiated and made by the buyer. So organized by the seller, but the insurance claim must be made by the buyer. That is a very, very, very good question. So um, uh, very good. Okay, moving on a little bit. Okay, CIP is the same as CPT, but CIP includes insurance of the goods organized by the seller, paid for by the seller. But again, if these goods were going by air, the risk would transfer from seller to buyer when the goods are delivered and risk transfers when the goods are in the custody of the carrier at the named port of, uh, sorry, uh, at the, if, we, if, if my story is about an air shipment. So in, in the context of my story, when the goods are handed into the custody of the first carrier and the seller has in his hand, the document and the goods are going by air. So the document will be an airway bill. So wonderful. And thank you for the question. Any more questions, just keep them coming to me. And oh, I have another one or two coming, but uh, they're about the ever given ship. So uh, I'm going to sail it. I'm going to say, I sail it. I'm going to save it until a little bit later. <laughs> now we've gone through the E terms, the F terms, the C terms, and now the D terms. So under the D terms, we move into uh, DAP, DPU, and DDP. So actually, we may be on time to finish on time, as we promised. So it sometimes happens that the buyer will say to the seller, um, Dear Mr. O'Brien, we, we like your product. Uh, we like it. But... Uh, we would like you to take delivery, the delivery risk of the goods. And I said, but I always do. You know, if it's FOB, uh, CIP, I'm always, I always deliver the goods per Incoterms. And the buyer said, yeah, 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 I know Incoterms. But we would like you to take the risk until the goods are delivered to a designated name place. And I said, yeah, I don't understand. And you said, Mr. O'Brien, okay? We're in Baku and Azerbaijan, okay? If it's CIP, the risk transfer is in Dublin, at Dublin airport. And I go, yeah, no, but we want you to take responsibility for the delivery to Baku, Baku International Airport. And I go, well, uh, we don't normally do that, but sure, you're a good customer, why not, okay? So Mr. O'Brien, we need you to give us the Incoterm DAP, Baku International Airport. And I go, okay, but uh, I need to check with the accounting people, but the price might go up a little bit. Don't worry about the price. Your goods are good. We make a good profit. We want DAP. I say, okay. So what's DAP? Under DAP, the seller has the carriage or transport obligation to the designated name place, Baku International Airport. But this time, the delivery and risk... Yeah. 
The delivery and risk does not occur at Dublin Airport. The delivery and risk transfer stays with the seller until the goods are delivered at the name place Baku, okay? International Airport. And the seller pays all costs. So basically the logistics risk stays with the seller till de delivered to the designated named place. And uh, actually, just getting to the second question, if I may change it a little bit regarding the ever given ship. If you think about the ever given ship that was stuck in the Suez Canal for six days, but now is still stuck in the same area, but in the Greater Bitter Lake, there was 18,300 containers on board that ship. If the Incoterm was CIF Dubai and the goods were shipped from Rotterdam, Port of Loading, Port of Discharge, Jebel Ali Port in Dubai, and it's CIF, the seller has contractually delivered when the goods were placed on board the vessel at Rotterdam. I think I said Rotterdam, Rotterdam. Very interesting. But if the Incoterm was DAP, Jebel Ali port in UAE, the goods have not been delivered yet. And if the goods have not been delivered and you read the contract, the buyer seller is probably not entitled to his payment. Now, of course, as you know, your letter of credit people, if documents were presented and they complied, well, seller gets his money, even though the ship is still stuck with the 18,300 containers. So really good question, really good point. And we might come back to it even a little bit later on. DAP does not include loading or un unloading of the goods at the place, point, or port of destination. So I must deliver, I'm responsible to deliver to the name place of destination, but unloading and associated charges are for the account of the buyer. Now, my dear friends, if the goods were shipped by air, this is totally irrelevant because unloading is always included in the air freight charges. And anyway, the goods are small, the goods are light. But if this was a marine shipment, or if it was a charter party shipment for a full shipment of goods, and we're using DAP, as you can, okay, well, the seller is not responsible for unloading. And that brings us to the brand new Incoterm, DPU, delivered at place, unloaded. So again, with this Incoterm, it's making the seller responsible for the supply chain. And in terms of global commerce, just Separately, more sellers and exporters prefer to control the supply chain because they have better transparency and control over their stock, their goods in transit, and the amount of goods they need to manufacture for their supply line. But DPU, delivered at place unloaded, carriage of the goods is organized and paid for by the seller. The risk stays with the seller till the goods are delivered to the designated name place, which could be Baku International Airport if the goods are going by air. The seller pays all costs, but this time, this time, because it's DPU, whether it's air or whether it's marine, DPU always includes the cost of unloading at the pay place, port, or point of destination, and of course, uh, import duty taxes for account of the buyer, okay? So we are nearly there, but not quite there yet. The final Incoterm, the final Incoterm for me to cover, you already know, maximum obligation of the seller to the buyer. And we have more than 50 people on our webinar. So thank you very, very much. DDP, maximum obligation of the seller to the buyer. Seller's carriage obligation to the designated name place, which is usually the buyer's warehouse or premises. The document is usually something called a POD, proof of delivery, where the buyer would be expected to sign a document acknowledging good receipt of the goods. Might sound funny, 
good receipt, which means good order receipt of the goods. The risk is with the seller till the goods are de delivered to the buyer's warehouse premises in Baku, Azerbaijan, from Ireland, and the costs are paid by the seller, but this time uniquely including, including the customs clearance and import duty in the country of import in Azerbaijan. So I have a question for you. Um, you can just say yes or no. In the chat, just please type in yes or no. Do you think, generally speaking, DDP is a good income term for an exporter, for me, the Irish exporter, exporting to anywhere, exporting to UAE, exporting to Pakistan, exporting to Azerbaijan? Is it, is it, is it a good one? What do you think? You know? No, no, no. <laughs> well, you all know your income terms. You're right. Okay. It's just everything else is kind of under my control the shipment, the insurance, the certificate of origin. But organizing the import duty on arrival, it's not, po it's not impossible. Sometimes we do it, but it's tricky. It's tricky. So I agree with you as a general thing, we're getting no, 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 no. Uh, someone said to me, possible. It is possible, but no is a good answer. Now I'm looking at the question. Oh, <laughs> a good idea question from uh, Louisa, I think it is. Louisa, regarding DPU, who pays import duty? Can contract state otherwise? Can contract state otherwise? Well, to, to be a little bit more precise, under DPU, goods unloaded, at the point, which could be the airport in Baku, but import duty is for account of the buyer. But you asked me, can the contract state otherwise? Yes. The income terms are the default rules and obligations of the parties, but if the terms and conditions of the contract agree between the parties state something otherwise, well, then you've modified the Incoterm rule. So that is really a good question. You're obviously paying uh, great attention at the, the webinar. So um, my dear friends, this brings us to, oh, Habib has uh, appeared. So yeah. uh, Habib, uh, when I see Habib appear, it means that I need to stop talking soon. But um, what I'm going to do, Habib, if you don't mind, just I'll go ahead for a moment, yes. is um, I have an Incoterms quiz. I have a number of questions, and I want the participants, if you don't mind, to type the answer in the chat. And in most cases, you need to type true or false or yes or no, in most, or maybe one or two. So I'm going to please participate, okay, just to see what we have picked up. So let's start with the quiz, and this will take me five minutes. So maybe I will be five minutes late in finishing, but only, only five minutes. Habib doesn't trust me, I know, but anyway, I'll do my best, okay. So here we ask the first question, and the first question I'm asking you is, well, there's no point in me asking the question. I pressed the button. So in all terms rules, the seller has an obligation to buy, provide the buyer with a commercial invoice. Well, that's true, there's no point. So now we're on to the second question and I'm watching the button, okay? Under X works, the seller delivers when it places the goods at the disposal of the buyer at the seller's premises loaded on the buyer's collecting vehicle. True or false? So please type in the answer. No, no, false, no, false, 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 no, no, false, false. We had one yes, but everyone else is no. Wonderful, guys. You know your income term, and the answer is false. Next question for you is when CPT, CIP, CFR are used, so a C Inca term, the seller fulfills its obligation to deliver when it hands over the goods to the carrier in the manner specified in the chosen rule and not when the goods reach the name port of destination. So the, quest the question is saying, the seller delivers when it hands over the goods or delivers uh, and not when they reach the destination. True or false? True or false, okay? 
True. Yes. 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 True. 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 Wonderful, guys. You are amazing. Okay. Under which of the 11 Incoterms rules must the seller deliver the goods on the key or a barge at the port of shipment? So not on board. So the risk of damage on the key, the risk of loss or damage to the goods passes when the goods are delivered on the key. So you need to pick one Incoterm. So I want you to type three letters. Which of the 11 Incoterms? And here we are. Oh, you all know it. You know your Inca terms, FAS, FAS on the key, on the key, FAS again. Yeah, wonderful, 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 wonderful. Great, fantastic. I hope you're right. I hope it is, is FAS. Wonderful. I'm going to do one or two more just to keep it going a little bit. I don't know when I'll stop, but one, one or two. Under CIF Inca terms, the buyer must clear the goods for import. True or false? Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Okay, wonderful. And the answer is true, 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 true. And true, true, true is the correct answer. Okay, I'm only going to do definitely two more, okay? And then we will stop. Okay, this is a good one if you're checking documents. A bill of lading, bill of lading, has been issued by the carrier in respect of a contract of sale between the seller and the buyer. So there's a bill of lading, so C-I-F. On reviewing the bill of lading, you would expect to see the bill of lading marked, and I need you to pick a word. Collect, paid, or not applicable. So I want you to write, it's a CIF contract, so would the bill of lading be marked freight collect, freight paid, or freight not applicable? So you can just type one of those words, freight paid, paid, freight paid. Paid, paid, freight, paid, paid. Everyone has got the correct answer. I hope it's the correct answer. It's the correct answer. And the final question I'm going to ask you is this one, even though I have many more, I'll be sharing the presentation so you can try them later. But here, let's go with this one. Under the term starting with the letter C or D, C or D, it is for the buyer to make the contract of carriage with the carrier. It's for the buyer to make the contract of carriage, which is the contract of transport, true or false. So if you get this one, if you get this one correct, uh, I will false, 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 false. No worry, very, very, very good. So I'm going to stop there, my dear friends, and I'm going to uh, stop sharing my screen. And I'm just checking, uh, have it regarding my questions. I think I've answered all. Let me just check the chat. Yeah. Uh, the chat, the chat was the answers. So I think I have uh, covered all. So have I, have I got everything? Or am I, I think am I, am uh, I most of them have been answered, but I guess one of the questions which I saw is uh, not been answered, which is uh, under FOB term. When the uh, title of the good is transferred from... Could, could, yeah, could, I can't see it because there's just so much text. Would you mind yeah. just reading it out slowly to me? Okay. So, okay. so they are asking that under FOB term, what yeah. time the title of the goods transfer from the seller to the buyer? That, that's a very good question. And I'm glad it was asked. Because there is kind of a perception, a perception that under FOB, because the goods are delivered when they're placed on board the vessel at the port of shipment. So there is a perception that the goods are delivered and not that the title, the title, yeah. your question, that the ownership or title has gone from seller to buyer when the goods are placed on board the vessel. Well, the answer is Inco terms don't deal with the ownership our title of the goods at all. It kind of sounds logical that, yes, it would be when they're placed on board, but the Inco terms don't cover this at all. It should be covered expressly in the contract of sale. And the most common terminology for transfer of title is that ownership or title transfers when the goods are paid for, okay? So really, really good question and uh, and so I think that's about it. Mm -hmm. And I'm watching the time and I think we're nearly on time. So yes, and I, I, I think I've done my bit. So 
Over to you, Yasmin. Yep. Vincent, thanks, thanks a lot for this uh, very interesting and great session. And uh, to be honest, uh, we we have a lack of this of sub, some uh, same type of uh, seminars uh, due to the due to the pandemic and sure. this the lockdowns and uh, uh, it's 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 really we 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 feel it. And uh, I think that. Uh, for us, for all of us, was today the very good uh, good chance to refresh our knowledge about the uh, Inca terms and uh, and uh, also about the uh, and for, to, to got some information on the uh, new new changes that happened in the uh, new edition of Inca terms 2020. And uh, for that, I would like to thank you and uh, to thank uh, Sanan from Dubai Chamber. Habib from ICC and uh, our colleagues from the Azerbaijan Bank Association uh, for the, for your uh, kind support and I'm doing this on behalf of uh, of uh, audience of the our banking community which are participated here. I believe that they uh, they enjoyed this session and uh, to be honest, we are looking forward for the next session which could be, for example, on the supply chain finance. And uh, we will uh, agree on you, and then let to to the uh, our colleagues the information on, on top of that. Thank you, thank you again. And uh, uh, if if we completed our mission for today, then uh, yeah, yeah, again, yeah, yes, you know, I, I I think we have. Um, I think supply chain finance is really a good subject, and it's one I will work on for a little bit later. So just to say, I just want to say thank you so much to Sanan Shafiga, I see is here for, she did so much background organizing, yourself, Yasin, and of course my colleague, uh, Habib. But most of all, I want to thank the participants for giving me their valuable time and attention. So thank you, everyone. And uh, I think that's it, Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Okay. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Vincent. Bye-bye.